Come as you are to worship the Lord. Come if you are happy. Come if you are sad. Come if you are rich. Come if you are poor. Come if your faith is strong. Come if your faith is weak. The Lord knows you better than you know yourself. Come and see. The Lord is good. Come and worship the Lord. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. It seems a long time since we met together, even remotely, for worship, so I should be wishing you a happy new year. But this new year has already been marked by much sadness. The coronavirus continues to dom dominate the way we live our lives. Liz, Jason and Ellie all have the virus and have been very poorly at home. We will remember them in our prayers and pray that the Lord will provide his healing hand on them. Our very dear friend, and my lifelong friend and musical buddy John Folkes passed away on New Year's Day after contracting Covid. We shall pray for Jenny, Chrissy, Vicky and all of the family. We should remember that even in our grief and sadness, the Lord is with us. So we will sing our first hymn, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come now before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence 
Before our prayers, I just wanted to give thanks to all who have ensured their offertory has continued during the lockdown, whether it be by cash, cheque or standing order. So we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, all of your gifts to us are good, and so we offer to you all of our gifts that have been made for the continued work of your church, by all means, as a token of our love. Amen. Wise and Holy One, you are beyond our imagination, beyond our understanding, beyond our humanity. And because you are beyond us, we turn to you for sanctuary. We come to you for protection. Wise and Holy One, you are not completely beyond our imagination because Jesus Christ shows us what you are like. You are not completely beyond our understanding because Jesus Christ teaches us the way. You are not completely beyond our humanity because Jesus Christ is one of us. And because you are beside us, we can walk alongside you. As a companion, we can speak honestly with you. As a friend, we can keep silence with you. Wise and Holy One, not completely beyond us, not only beside us, but deep within our being. Spirit of God, when we feel confused, help us to make sense of life and offer it to others. When we feel abandoned, help us to know your love and share it with others. When we feel at a loss, help us to rediscover hope and offer it to others. When we fail to love you, help us to know your forgiveness and share it with others. Encourage us to leave what is past and travel on with you and all your people into your glorious future. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today, being the second Sunday of Epiphany, I don't think it's too late for us to sing a final hymn about the wise men. This next hymn is a traditional one, quite well known, but with revised words. Now, I'm not too keen on a lot of changed words because I usually end up singing the old ones anyway. But I'll make an exception of this one, which follows on nicely from the theme of our prayers. So we'll sing, as with gladness, men of old. Thank you. 
Bear is having a rest today, but I do have a story for you this morning, perfect for the snowy time of year. Well, I say perfect, but as I record this, there's no snow cast for Sunday. Never mind, you'll just have to imagine it. Some pictures might help. I love the snow when it has just fallen and everywhere is quiet and covered in a blanket of untouched white. This story concerns three brothers and a time just like that. It had been snowing all night and early in the morning everywhere was covered. The three brothers were eager to go out to play in the snow so they got up early, wrapped up warm and went out into the fields at the bottom of their garden. They had great fun all morning building snowmen, having snowball fights, having such fun in fact that they forgot all about the time. Dinner was ready in the house, so their father came out into the snow to call them in for dinner. He noticed that the next field was completely untouched, a perfect blanket of snow, and he had an idea. He lined the boys up on one side of the field, a little way apart from each other, and he stood on the other side. We're going to have a race, he said, but the winner won't be the one who gets to me first. It will be the one who can walk to me in the straightest line. So they started off. The first boy set off quite carefully, watching his footprints to make sure he was going straight. First watching where he had been, and then checking where he was going. When he got to the other side, his line of footprints was not too straight at all. The second boy was quite confident that he would do better than the other two, and he set off at quite a pace, looking back and from side to side to see how the other two were doing. Ha ha, he thought, as he passed the first boy. Look how wobbly his path is. But as soon as he got to the other side, it was quite obvious that his own path was quite wobbly too. But what of the third boy? He took no notice of the other boys, but looked straight at his father. He didn't look down or back. He didn't stop. He just walked steadily and straight to his father. And of course, he made the straightest line and won the race. So what can we learn from this story? Well, life's a bit like that race. If we go through life looking back and not looking where we're going, we'll soon stray from the path like the first boy and get into all sorts of trouble. And if, like the second boy, we go through life comparing ourselves to others and thinking that we're better than them, well, that's not right, is it? But if we focus our life on Jesus, let him be our guide and live our life the way he wants us to, then we will stay on the straight path. 67 years ago, no man had ever run a mile in under four minutes. Then, on 6th of May 1954, a man called Roger Bannister did it. Within two months, another man, John Landy, did it 1.4 seconds quicker. Soon after that, the two men ran together in a race. But who would win? As they entered the final lap, John Landy was in the lead. It looked as if he would win. But as the finish line came nearer, he couldn't stop thinking, where is Bannister? He had to turn and look, something he'd always been taught not to do. And as he did so, Roger Bannister took the lead. Later, John Landy said, if I hadn't looked back, I would have won. Now, St. Paul had something to say about this too. He said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking to Jesus. Kate's now going to give us our first reading from the book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord and Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel! And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli. He said, 
here I am for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call you my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time and he got up and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. Thank you, Kate. Now, some of you may not know this next song. Others will know exactly which song is coming. It was mainly written by Nick James, who played drums for Discovery many years ago. We only got to sing it when the reading from Samuel that you've just heard was included. And on those occasions, it would be sung by John. So join in when you get the hang of it as we sing, Speak Lord, your servant is listening. Oh, 
Our next reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Christmas is behind us and we are now in the season of Epiphany, which starts with what is known as the physical manifestation of the Christ child to the Gentiles as represented by the wise men. Last week, the readings focused on Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist, revealing more of the nature of Jesus as the Son of God. Today, we join Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and the calling of his disciples, in particular, Philip and Nathaniel. If you were reading the opening psalm this morning, you will have noticed these words. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. Put simply, God knows us, not just those who know him, Everyone. He knows us all. I was reminded of a 40-year-old song by Cliff Richard called You Know Me Better Than I Know Myself. I'm not going to sing it to you now, but the chorus says, You know me better than I know myself. Time after time, I've found it to be true. No one loves me like you. Check it out. It's one of my favourites. That theme also comes into our Old Testament and Gospel readings this morning. Samuel, we are told, did not yet know God or his word, even though he was serving God in the temple. Sounds strange, but it was probably similar to when I started serving as an altar server in the Anglican church when I was about 12. I was serving in the church, but I don't think I really knew God at that age. We are all at a different stage on our journey of faith. So Samuel didn't know God, but God knew Samuel, and God knew that Samuel was the one he would call to him. Samuel wasn't looking for God. In fact, he thought it was Eli, the priest, calling him. Eli realised that God was calling Samuel and told him what to do. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening, said Samuel. And God spoke to him. This theme is almost missed in the Gospel reading. It starts, The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, did you hear the words, follow me? Or did you hear, he found Philip? Philip didn't find Jesus. Jesus found Philip. It's a simple truth of the Christian story that we do not decide for Christ. Christ decides for us. And the narrative that runs through the Bible is of a God who constantly seeks out his people. 
Having sought out Philip, Jesus issues the single command, follow me. So what did Philip do next? Did he join a church? Spend hours reading scripture to learn about his new leader? Did he get baptised? No, none of these things. The first thing he does is find Nathaniel and tell him about Jesus. But how could he do that, you may say? I couldn't possibly do that. I don't know enough to tell other people about Jesus. How would I handle the objections? Now that's an interesting statement. How would I handle the objections? How do you take the knockbacks? Or well, further on in, we learn that Philip received an objection or a knockback with his very first bit of evangelism to Nathaniel. On being told about Jesus by Philip, the news that Philip was pretty passionate about, Nathaniel puts him down with the suggestion that he can't do any good because he's from Nazareth and what good ever came out of Nazareth. Sometimes when we tell someone about Jesus, it can be met with cynicism or rudeness or apathy. It can be discouraging or knock our self-confidence, but we don't need to get into heavy theological discussions. Philip didn't get into a deep discussion with Nathaniel about why Jesus was a good thing even though he came from Nazareth. He just said, come and see. Don't take my word for it, see for yourself. God will do the rest. And he did too. For as we learned at the beginning, God knows every one of us. Jesus knew Nathanael and that he was someone who had no deceit. Nathanael wondered how that could be. And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Now this is not meant literally. The Greek word translated as see is not the same word as in the word in come and see, meaning with your eyes, which Philip said to Nathanael. The second use of the word see, as in I saw you under the fig tree, refers to a spiritual perception. The symbol of sitting under a fig tree is used several times in the Bible and refers to living in the peace and blessing of a relationship with God. When I first came to Castle Hill Church, it was initially because of my involvement with the music group which became Discovery about 37 years ago. It was John who told me to come and see. We would play at an evening service once a month, which came to be known as the bag service. Bag stood for bring a guest. It was the hope of Wilfred Diggins, the minister at the time, that every month people would bring a guest along to the service and maybe they would bring along someone else. And in that way, the congregation would grow. And in a small way, that did happen. You're probably thinking, but how can we do that when we're locked down and only meeting virtually? Well, here's the thought. How about sharing this service on your own Facebook page? It could be a start. One click with the words, come and see. God will do the rest for he knows every one of us. Now, in response to these words, we're now going to sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you come and follow me if I call your name? Will you go away? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I would call your name? Will you care for cool and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or stare? Touch and sound in you and you in me. 
You may have seen the link we posted earlier this week from the Baptist Union urging continued prayer during the pandemic. So we come to God in prayer, firstly using our bookmark prayer for those affected by coronavirus. Let us pray. God of healing and hope, in Jesus you meet us in our places of pain and fear. Look with mercy on those who have contracted the new virus, on any who are vulnerable, and on all who feel in danger. Through this time of global concern, by your Holy Spirit, bring out the best, not the worst in us. Make us more aware of our independence on each other, and of the strength that comes from being one body in you, through Christ, our wounded healer. Amen. We pray for all NHS staff, for their own safety, energy and peace in dealing with each and every patient. We pray for those in hospital leadership, for wisdom and for good decisions to give the best outcomes for patients. We pray for patients, for healing, for peace and ultimately to fight this disease and get home. We pray for their relatives who may be feeling helpless at the very time when they need to be with their loved ones. We particularly pray for our minister Liz and Jason and Ellie, that they may be restored to health. And we also pray for Chloe and Josh. We give thanks that vaccines are now being rolled out and pray that they will work against this latest strain of COVID-19. Lord, we commend to your lasting peace, our dear friend John. Be with those who mourn, Jenny, Chrissy, Vicky, and all of their family and friends. In their grief, may they know your love. Amen. God of mercy, we pray for a world in which even ordinary humanity fails so often. We pray for government ministers in every nation. We pray that those who lead and take on great responsibilities may not simply wish to seem great in the eyes of others, but may genuinely serve their people, searching continually for policies which will be for the good of all, especially for the weakest and most vulnerable. We pray for all of our church friends at Castle Hill, Doddridge Memorial, and the Headlands, for our ecumenical partners in the town, and for those who lead us from Synod and Church House. Amen. So now we sing our final hymn, Go Forth and Tell. Oh, oh. 
Let us go out into the world as bringers of love, as makers of peace and as messengers of hope, knowing that the blessing of God, the source of life, of Jesus Christ, the way to life, and of the Holy Spirit, the sustainer of life, is with us today, tomorrow and forever. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. What can